welcome to a brand new podcast. This is Everything with Everett, a podcast dedicated to hosting important conversations. Everything with Everett is hosted by Everett McConaughey from Boise, Idaho. Everett is an Idaho native who is ready to share his thoughts and observations on a wide variety of subjects. Politics, science, faith, religion, technology, and so much in between. How did we get here? What can we learn from each other? How can we put the past into a healthy conversation that helps us grow tomorrow? This is Everything with Everett, a conversation worth having. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another week. With This is Everything with Everett with Everett McConaughey. I'm Everett McConaughey. If you couldn't tell, or if you don't know, maybe you're new to the podcast, maybe you've been listening since the beginning, or maybe you jumped in somewhere in between. Welcome. I'm happy to be chatting with you. Today, I would like to start a two-part series. Um, Today we'll be all talking and the next episode later this week will be an all audio podcast. That one is, I have a segment that I'm playing that will literally take up my entire allotment. So there won't be any of the standard intro outro. It's just going to be audio and it relates to today. So I am going to talk to you guys about electrical transcription records. Those are some very large discs. They look like a typical record, but they're quite a bit bigger. So I'm going to go through uh, some history on them today. And the next episode on Wednesday will feature audio from a 1951 NBC program that was recorded by KIDO. Either way, it ha- it says KIDO on the label. And when I worked at KIDO, it was housed in the behind this uh, glass uh, front frame hanging on the wall, and nobody knew what was on it. It hadn't been listened to by anyone that was around, and there was just this historic piece of equipment in a glass uh, case. Uh, Apparently somebody had the idea of like, oh, let's play it and listen to it. But um, being a transcription record that required a very unique device to play it on, as well as a different speed than a standard home use record player. So that was why I think a lot of the time it went unheard. Thanks to the wonderful people over at the History of Idaho Broadcasting Foundation, Art Gregory, the president, he was the one that found the equipment and remastered, I guess you could say. He transcribed the transcription record from its original native vinyl format into a digital form and was kind enough to provide that to the public on their website at historyofidahobroadcasting.org. And I am going to be playing that entire audio file for you. It is actually two audio files that I have joined together into one for the show. Uh, Total runtime is 30 minutes. It's got music, talking. It's about Boise. It's called the uh, Big City Serenade by NBC Radio. And it was shared on all their radio stations back in 1951. Big City Serenade, orchestra, music, a little bit of history about the city of Boise. I think you're all going to enjoy it. If you're interested in Boise, just moved to Boise, you've always lived in Boise, or just like hearing some really cool things. I think it's got it's got something for everybody. So starting with the topic for today, and for those of you watching the YouTube recording, Pardon the bad angles. At least I'm getting something done. The brand new computer arrived today. The moves happens in a few weeks. It's only a little bit longer before 
everything just gets so much easier to do. I'm excited. Anywho. All right. So electrical transcriptions are a special phonograph recording made exclusively for radio broadcasting. These were widely used during the, quote, golden age of radio. They provided material from station identification, jingles, and commercials to full-length programs. This was used by local stations, which were affiliates of one of the radio networks. Physically, electrical transcription records look much like long-playing records that were popular for decades. They differ from consumer-oriented recordings, however, in that they were distributed to radio stations for the purpose of broadcast, and not for sale to the public. The electric transcription had higher audio quality and was higher audio quality than what was available to the consumer, largely because it had less surface noise than commercial recordings. The emergence of the electrical transcriptions. Electrical transcriptions were made practical by the development of the electrical recording, which superseded Thomas Edison's original purely mechanical recording method. This was in the mid-20s. Marsh Laboratories in Chicago began issuing electrical recordings on its obscure autograph label in 1924. But it was Western Electric's superior technology, adopted by the leading labels Victor and Columbia in 1925, which launched the then-new microphone-based method into general use in the recording industry. So prior to that, everything audio had been recorded via mechanical means. This is the basically the original switch from... Um, mechanical recording to a lot closer to what we have today where everything is done by electrical signals and then put into um, some type of medium. Now it's completely digital and electrical. Uh, Freeman Gosden and Charles Correll are credited with being the first to produce electrical transcriptions. In 1928, they began distributing their almost an Andy program to stations other than their home station at WMAQ in Chicago. They used a 12-inch 78 RPM disc that provided two five-minute segments and a commercial break in between. One audio historian was quoted as saying that the new methods of electronic reproduction and improved record material have produced very little background noise were developed. By the end of the decade, the use of the phonograph music had largely been replaced by the new electron, electrical, that word's such a tongue twister for some reason, electrical transcription. With the fidelity available, it was difficult to tell a transcription from the original artist. In 1948, an ad for a disc manufacturer touted the use of transcriptions on the Voice of America, saying, a substantial part of these daily programs are recorded and due to the excellent quality of the, these transcriptions, such recorded portions cannot be distinguished from the live transmissions. Electro, electrical transcriptions were often used for recording programs in old-time radio. Using a record, a recording speed of 33 and a third revolutions per minute, in contrast to the 78 RPM speed that was then the standard for records for home use, 15 minutes of material could be stored on one side of a typ typical 16-inch diameter transcription. In contrast, commercially available 78 RPM records lasted for only 3 to 4 minutes per side and had, quote, very poor frequency response. WOR in New York City was one of the first radio stations to broadcast transcriptions starting in 1929. Other stations followed until more than 100 were doing so, largely because this new kind of recording made programming more flexible and improved sound. Dr. John R. Brinkley is generally credited for being the first performer to provide electrical transcriptions to radio stations. Brinkley's use of the then-new technology arose out of the necessity 
when agencies of the federal government prevented him from crossing from Mexico into the United States to use the federal government. I lost my spot. To use telephone lines to connect to U.S. stations remotely. Brinkley began recording onto electrical transcription discs and sending them across the border for later broadcast. WOR used transcriptions for repeat broadcasts of programs. In 1940, for example, the station repeated its episodes of Glenn Miller's and Kay Kaiser's orchestras. The Goldbergs and Sherlock Holmes. Electrical transcriptions were indispensable from the mid-30s to the late 40s, wrote Dr. Waller, Walter J. Bupri, B-E-A-U-P-R-E, who worked in radio before moving into academia. Uh, KIDO actually had a transcription turntable that could record and play back. It had two arms on these units. Uh, one arm could play, and then the other one could almost, it was located exactly 180 degrees on the other side of the platter for from the recording arm. And you could actually record and play back almost in real time. So you could record off of like a wire service from a network provider and then play it back over the air onto your station at any point. So that's why I believe that the record that I have the audio for for the next episode is was recorded by KIDO for KIDO about the city of Boise and mentioning KIDO from NBC. So moving on to transcription services. As radio stations' demand for transcriptions grew, companies specializing in transcriptions grew to meet the demand. On October in October 1933, 33 companies competed in producing transcriptions. Such companies included uh, Langois and Wenneth, Wen- Wentworth Incorporated, RCA Thesaurus, SESAC, S-E-S-A-C, World Broadcasting System, and Ziv Company. Associated Broadcasting Company Transcription Service, a former division of the Muzak Corporation. Uh, Muzak sold its Manhattan studios, but not the service. A former division, but not transcription service, to RCA Victor in 1951. Subscribing to a major transcription service meant the station received an initial group of transcriptions plus periodically issued new discs and a license which allowed the use of the material on air. Typically, a station did not own the discs. They were leased for as long as the station paid the necessary fees. Those fees typically ranged from $40 to $150 per week for eight 15-minute programs. That's why radio stations need advertising. It costs money. (laughs) Customers for transcriptions were primarily smaller stations. Uh, Brewster and Broughton, in their book, Last Night a DJ Saved My Life, wrote that transcriptions lessened the reliance on the announcer or disc jockey, and because of a transcription was made specifically for broadcast, it avoided record company litigation. They quoted uh, Ben Sullivan, who worked for a transcription company, as saying, most stations could not afford the orchestras and productions that went into the network radio shows. And so we supplied nearly 300 stations with transcriptions that frequently, but not always, featured the most popular bands and vocalists. A slogan used by in an advertisement for one transcription service might well have been applied to the industry as a whole, transcribed so that advertisers everywhere may have radio at its commercial best. This was a transition point from the golden age of radio in like the 1920s radio stations used to have um, an entire staff. They had, you know, engineers and all the typical station stuff, but they actually, there was laws that said that all stations had to have a minimum 
um, on in-house orchestra to provide uh, perform live performances. So they would have these big um, buildings, studio spaces, where they could have essentially concerts that they'd play into your radio, and it had to all be in in live uh, format because they didn't have a way to record things until these transcription records came into play. Uh, a 1948 ad for a transcription service, World Broadcasting System, contained a letter which praised the company S.A. Vetter, assistant to owner of WWPB AM and FM stations in Miami, Florida, wrote, You will be interested in knowing that I consider the purchase of the World Feature Library as the best buy I have made in 21 years in Miami radio. The popularity of at least one library was indicated in another 1948 ad, one for Standard Radio Transcription Services Incorporated. The ad boasted its standard program library was, quote, now serving over 700 stations, end quote. That same year, an ad for another transcription service, World Broadcasting System, said, over 640 stations now use the Great World Library. Another supply company, the Associated Program Service, advertised its transcription library as being not the usual one-shot recording date, not the routine disc or two, but real continuity of performance, a dependable, steady supply of fresh music, great depth of titles. Among the companies providing transcription services were Radio Networks, NBC, began electrical transcription service in 1934. Lloyd C. Egner, manager of electrical transcriptions at NBC, wrote that the NBC syndicated record recorded program service, later named RCA slash NBC, the Saras Library, the company sought, quote, to make available two stations associated with NBC our extensive programming resources to help in the sale of their facilities to local advertisers. He added, each program series will be as completely programmed as if it were to be for a network client. In other words, they will be designed to sell a sponsor's product or service. In 1948, an ad for NBC's service touted, quote, now 25 shows tailored for better programming at lower cost, end quote. They added that the company ma company's material was programmed and proven at over 1,000 radio stations. CBS also had a transcription division, Columbia Recording Corporation. Capitol Records began better known for its popular recordings, also had a transcription service, and ad in the trade publication, Broadcasting, asked in a headline if the reader was finding it tough to sell time. The ad's text promoted 3,000 selections with more added monthly from Peggy Lee, Jane Garber, Johnny Mercer, and other top stars, adding more than 300 stations already use it. One source estimated by the end of the 1930s, transcription services had built up a market of $10 million. Transcription services programming was not limited to music. Mystery, drama, other genres of programming were distributed by transcription. At least two transcribed dramas, I Was Communist for the FBI and Bold Venture, were distributed, were distributed more than, to more than 500 stations each. NBC's transcription offerings included Aunt Mary, a soap opera, The Haunting Hour, a psychological mystery, the playhouse of favorites, a drama, and modern romances. Transcriptions used by advertisers. Advertisers found electrical transcriptions useful for distributing their messages to local stations. Spot advertising is said to have begun in the 1930s. The spot announcements were easily, to ease, easily produced and distributed throughout the country via electrical transcription as an alternative to network advertising. In 1944, the spot 
jingle segment of transcriptions was estimated to have an annual value of $10 million. Of course, there was a benefit to performers using a transcription record. Transcriptions proved advantageous for performers, especially musicians. In the big band era, using transcription helped them reach one audience via radio while making personal appearances in front of another audience. Additionally, if more stations used their transcription, that increased audience for their music even more. An item in a 1946 issue of Radio Mirror magazine noted Bing Crosby's transcription deal with Philco has started a rush of others of other sought-after radio performers for deals of a similar nature. Their advantages for form such a setup include more free time and corporate setups to re relieve their tax costs. Recording commercials and jingles for spot announcements was a source of income for performers and writers. In 1944, Cliff Edwards received $1,500 for recording a 30-second gum jingle. Now, the government wanted part of the transcription record history. In World War II, they brought a, brought a new use for electrical transcriptions, the storage of audio material for broadcasting to people in the military. The American Forces Network began using electrical transcriptions during the war and continued using them through 1998. That's interesting. More than 300,000 Armed Forces Radio TSTS. What's that stand for? Transcription service? I don't know. Electrical transcription discs were stored in a collection at the Library of Congress. Congress. Transcriptions were often used for government issued programs, which were sent to the individual stations for broadcast on designated dates. Recruiting shows for the branches of the military service arrived on such discs and the United States government shipped many programs during wartime as transcriptions. During the war, the federal government, in conjunction with the intercollegiate broadcasting system, provided approximately eight 15-minute transcribed programs every week to each of the 35 college stations. The Voice of America also used transcriptions with one disc manufacturer noting in an ad, a substantial part of this daily program is recorded. Some other notable use, a network ban on pre-recorded material was temporarily lifted in, on the occasion of the crash of the airship Hindenburg in Lakehurst, New Jersey on the 6th of May, 1937. A recording of the crash made for Chicago Radio WLS announcer Herbert Morrison was allowed to be broadcast over the network by NBC. This is the well-known Oh, the Humanity recording. Usually heard only as a brief excerpt, the reproduced at a speed which differs significantly from the original recording speed, causing Morrison's voice to sound unnaturally high-pitched and excessively frantic. When heard, it is entirely... When heard in its entirety... And at the correct speed, the report is still powerful. It looks like we're running close on the end of time. So basically, you can tell that uh, from what I've gone over so far, transcription records really kind of expanded the horizons of getting um, content to rural locations as well as um, getting things overseas, because we didn't have the internet. We didn't have the um, quick ways to transfer data like we do now. So it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around, but they were actually having to send these records to different facilities to get them on the air, get them ready to go ahead of time and say, hey, hold on to this disc for like two weeks, and then on this date, play it. And then, then you have all these stations throughout the country playing the same thing on the same date, and you have a unified delivery of this content to these communities.
Uh, so the demise of the transcription record. Beginning in the 1940s, two factors caused radio stations' use of transcriptions to diminish. After World War II, use of the transcription diminished as disc, disc jockeys became more popular. That increased the popularity meant that increased popularity meant that stations began to use commercial recordings more than they had in the past. Because remember, trans, commercial recordings didn't sound as great, and they weren't specifically made for broadcast. The trade magazine Billboard reported in a November 22, 1952 article that, quote, transcription libraries have become, have come in upon enough, I'm sorry, over. Transcription libraries have come upon rough times, owing to the fact that rec records have largely taken place of the old-fashioned electrical transcriptions. In the 1940s, Decreased demand caused transcription services to reduce the royalty they pay copyright owners from $15 per tune per year to $10 per tune per year. By 1952, still less demand resulted in negotiations for a percentage of gross sales to replace the flat fee. By the late 1959, at least two transcription services Companies had gone out of business, selling their libraries to a company that provided rec recorded background music on tapes and discs. The purchaser acquired a total of approximately 12,000 selections from the two companies. Magnetic tape and tape recorders became popular at radio stations after World War II, taking over the functions that in-house transcription disc recording had served. Tape's advantages included lower cost, higher fidelity, more recording time, and the possibility of reuse after erasing, and the ease of editing. When I grew up in the KIDO studios as a child, they still had a lot of reel-to-reel -reel and the 8-track audio cassette tapes. I remember the big old magnet they had on the desk that the producer would have to use to wipe that disc to reuse it for something else. They had the label on everything, it was a song, intro, whatever. And so every, everything required its own physical media to play back on their air. Now everything's in a file, and you just hit play whenever you want it. Tape was definitely a thing until 99, 2000. There was a lot of he hesitation towards the electronic way of doing things. And when I worked at KBOI, there was still some close-by attached tape players and I heard from some staff members that they kept them ready to, in quote, standby through at least 2001 um, as a backup for important interviews and recordings just because they didn't trust the digital means of recording and playback. Of course, now everything's audio. Audio is now over internet connections. It's not even analog anymore. So things have really changed. Anyway. Stand by for the next episode, and it'll be a full 30 minutes of Big City Serenade from NBC 1951, recorded by KRDO, about the beautiful city of Boise, music that is meant to highlight some of the cultural history of the station from its founding and that still exists today. I hope you enjoy. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and I hope to talk to you next time. Thanks. You can join the conversation anytime. Call or text 208-391-2808. Also, you can connect on Twitter. Look for at Everett Podcast. Listen to all available episodes of Everything with Everett, as well as find out where to subscribe. More information at everettmcconaughey.com forward slash podcast. <laughs>